What's good, Knicks Nation? Alex Jeter is here, aka the Tratacaster, back again with another game of the week preview. We took we took a little hiatus, but we're back in action right now. And today we're going to preview the New York Knicks facing off against the San Antonio Spurs, which you can catch on Wednesday. And with me today to break this game down is Noah Magaro George. He is a writer and editor for Pounding the Rock, which is through the SB Nation uh, website. Or SB Nation, uh, was I guess the collective, whatever you want to call it. And then you also got the host. He's also the host of Alamo City Limits, which you can also find through SB Nation. But before we get into knowing, getting deep diving into this game and, and previewing it, make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to share, like, comment on all these videos. And make sure to check out KnicksFanTV.com. Let's get into it. Noah, my man, how are you feeling today, bro? How are you doing? I'm great. You know, it's a new year. Uh, new opportunities are in front of us, uh, whether that's for the Knicks, whether that's for me or yourself or the Spurs. So just happy to talk about basketball. Really appreciative that you brought me on this show. I'm really excited for it. Of course, man. I checked out some of your material. You're doing awesome work. Well, what you've been doing. Actually, uh, we were talking about this before we we hopped on. We overlapped at fan side for a little bit. You were over at uh, Air Alamo. I was doing some work for... Uh, hoops habit as well as empire rights back both different blogs uh for uh, for fan sided so it's cool that we finally get to to connect this way instead <laughs> of just being you know like separated moons apart planets apart now we get to actually discuss and dissect this upcoming game so let's rip the band-aid off and hop right into it what do you think about the spurs season overall you know they they seem uh it seems like they're in the Wemby sweepstakes right now is that is that the is that the move i don't know if it's like an intentional tank, you know, I think a lot of teams, maybe you look at the Rockets or the Knicks where they're they're bad by design. I think the Spurs are somewhat bad by design because of the front office, but you look at what Greg Popovich is doing, the players that he's putting out there, the minutes that he's giving, the kind of rotations he's throwing out there. It doesn't feel like they're losing intentionally, but they're losing because of their personnel. And I'm sure we'll talk a lot about the personnel on this team, but it feels like they're creeping into that Wimbenyama sweepstakes, but it's hard to tell, right? I mean, all those Western Conference teams, they're separated by like two, three, four games. The Spurs could go on a three-game win streak. Another team could go on a you know four-game losing streak, and all of a sudden you're in the play-in picture. So I don't want to promise anything, but it does feel like they're definitely inching towards that Wimbenyama sweepstakes and cementing themselves there for sure. I mean, that's kind of how it feels like from afar, just seeing that, just because right now the Spurs are second to last, you know, in the Western Conference, and you, and you talk about like the way everything's shaking out. You got Golden State Warriors going up and down. Phoenix Suns are a playing right, playing team right now, even though they should be championship contending. I mean, the Mavericks are excelling with just Luka Doncic and scraps. <laughs> so the Western Conference is all over the place, and that's just kind of the NBA season overall, man. Which is it, it's made it fun and interesting. But talking about you know how the Suns should be a contender and like how uh, it was like uh, the the West is just a shakeup right now. The Spurs were in a shakeup for quite some time. They were a dominant force. You know, you had your big three with Mono Ginobili, Tony Parker, Tim Duncan. How's life been post the big three era? It's been strange, right? I mean, because I think Spurs fans, or even if you're covering this team as a media member or a blogger or whatever, it's been really weird to kind of have them be good enough to be in a play-in, but not really good enough to be a full-fledged playoff team and they're also not bad enough to be at the bottom of the lottery and then you have you know Kawhi asking out and you get DeRozan era and then you briefly have a DeJounte Murray era and now they've pivoted towards what feels like more of a legitimate rebuild so it's been strange there's been a lot of contention among the fan base people mm. arguing over the last years oh should they push for the plan or oh should they just you know call it a season and now it should be you know focus on getting the best pick possible so there's been a lot of infighting among the fan base but this season has been different. There's been a different feel around it for sure because I think the front office and Popovich have just been so transparent about, you know, we're not competing for a championship. We may not even be competing for the playoffs, but we're going to go out there and try. So that's their promise. We're going to try. And so far trying hasn't, <laughs> hasn't done too much for them, but I've enjoyed the season from a developmental standpoint. A lot of young guys, a lot of fun guys on this team. For sure, for sure. And it feels like we're, you know, talk about disputes within the fan base. It's kind of where the New York <laughs> Knicks are right now, you know, with uh, with the Julius Randle era, R.J. Barrett, because um, they both came on the Knicks at the same time. And fans are like, you know, whether it should be trading high off of Julius Randle right now to really just develop the youth and get a high lottery pick, or do you continue to work through the playoffs experience and just continue to build through the team that way? 
Sounds like a lot of similar stuff, but the only difference <laughs> is that you guys had a lot of success with your big three you got championships over there. So for the Knicks, you know, it's been a lot of years of just down. You know, we had a mellow stint for a little bit. That was fun. 2012, 2013 was a great time. Still living off those vibes. 2018, you know, made that magical four seed appearance uh, in the Eastern Conference. And now right now, the Knicks are currently, was it 20 and 18? They're eighth uh, in the Eastern Conference. So they're in that playing territory. But when you look at the front office, you talk about transparency with with Greg Popovich and uh, and the front office staff. The front office staff is doing over there. They've been kind of they they've been transparent over here too to to a degree. They've said they want to work on the youth. They're doing that right now. You're talking about how uh, they want to compete for plans, and they've kind of been backing that up. They went out and got Jalen Brunson competing. So they 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 they've been showing that they want to be a playoff type team and build that way. And you also saw, like, I'm sure you're aware as everyone else around the media landscape and NBA coverage is that Knicks were trying to get Donovan Mitchell this past off season. So when you see that, that just screams, they want to compete. So for the Knicks, that's where they are right now. But you mentioned some youth going back to the Spurs, you know, you got, you had that DeJounte Murray era. I want to get some, I want to talk on that. Did you see that trade coming? Because I didn't see him going to the Hawks. And I kind of was a little shocked that he he didn't want to stay with the Spurs. Yeah, I think it was a little bit of a blindside for fans. But I think if you look at it from the perspective of how the CBA works and how contracts work, they got him on such a good deal when they extended him that the next extension that they could offer him could only be, you know, a certain percentage above that. And when you look at that, they were only going to be able to offer him about $69 million for three years, which... If you're an all-star in the NBA, whether it's injury replacement or you're perennial all-star, you're not you're not saying yes to that money. So mm-hmm. it was either that trade him, move, you know, trade him somewhere where he wants to be, or B, you wait until he's an unrestricted free agent, and at that point in time, you could get nothing back. You know, you could just walk for for nothing. You would get nothing, no picks, no players, no assets, and so you've lost a really valuable player for absolutely nothing. So I think. You know, for fans, I think it did blindside them a little bit because I don't think fans are, you know, nitpicking the CBA and looking at contracts every day. But I think for people who cover the team, it made a lot of sense, especially when, once DeJounte and his agent with Clutch said, yeah, we're we're not interested in signing an extension. We're We're willing to see where this goes. And, you know, he's gone. Fans were really upset. But honestly... And I, I'm sure I'll take flack for this. DeJounte Murray's not a franchise player. He's mm. an injury replacement all-star. The the Hawks are losing with him next to Trey Young, which isn't necessarily the best pairing, but he just was never going to lead you anywhere. And and that's not you know supposed to be a slight to him. They just didn't have him in the right role. You know, if he's your best player, you're not going anywhere. You're going to the plan. And and, and <laughs> you see it two straight years, they lose in the plan. So I think they they were right to move off from him and try to rebuild for real this time. Okay, because you know I look at this team right now, and you got uh, you got Mer- well, you have. Uh- Devin Vassell, you got Keldon Johnson, Jeremy so- uh, uh, Sohan, you got uh, Jakob Pertle. I thought having DeJounte Murray with all those guys, that would have been like a nice uh, competitive team. But are you saying that you would have just been stuck in the middle with that type of team? Or do you think that you could have just figured out how to retool, move up in drafts, or find that star that wanted to come to San Antonio? Yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways to look at it. I mean, when you have DeJounte Murray on your team, just with how he plays the game, um, his strengths, his weaknesses. He's not a great off-ball player. He's not a great cutter. He needs to have the ball in his hands to be efficient. So, you know, last year he was fourth in the NBA in touches per game. He was top 10 in usage. You know, he had big numbers, but it was because the ball was in his hands so often. When you have a player who forces you to play a heliocentric style of basketball, everyone else comes second. And if your offensive engine is just not that efficient, like you look at him, his true shooting numbers weren't great. His efficient field goal percentage wasn't great. He was below average and just you know, field goal percentage, free throw percentage, three-point percentage, uh, you're not going anywhere. So if you have him on your team and you have, you know, Keldon Johnson or Devin Vassell, they're probably not getting the same numbers they are when he's gone. So I think even if he was here, you're looking at guys maybe having incremental improvements to their three-point percentage or points per game or usage or touches. But as long as he's there, you kind of have to force him the ball because he's just not that useful off ball. He's not a catch and shoot guy. Doesn't have a lot of utility as a cutter. Doesn't have a lot of utility as a screener. He's not a guy who's going to spot up anywhere around the court. So, you know, I'd, I'd love to, to to look at this and go, 
you know, if they kept him around, maybe they're competitive, but I think they are. They're competitive for a plan. And if you're in the plan, you know, congrats to teams who get there, but you're probably in NBA purgatory where you're not good enough to tank, but you're not really good enough to win anything. And you get stuck in that cycle and you don't want to be there. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and, you know, I look at this team. So it's not that I look at this team, but I guess watching them play against the Knicks, it seems like there's a better ball movement, more like team effort overall. Is that the brand of bat? I was, that's the Spurs brand of basketball. That's kind of what they've been known for, for so long, especially with the big three era. Is that kind of what the Spurs want to go back to, especially with Greg Popovich? I think so. I think everything has changed. And, you know, with DeJounte Murray gone, you can't really play that heliocentric style. You don't have a lead ball handler who can go get his own bucket, who can create for others on a play-to-play -play basis. So you're forced to play that motion offense style where they're not really even running a lot of set plays. It's just a lot of screens, a lot of cutting, um, a lot of diving, a lot of flashing, a lot of transition possessions, a lot of screens, a lot of guys who are ducking to the basket. Um, you know, there, there's not a lot of set plays like we talked about, but there is a lot of motion and there is a lot of movement. And it's it's more fun to watch that, I think, because it's equal opportunity. There's never a moment where you're just watching and there's a guy just standing there for possessions at a time. It's, you know, one unit working together. And even though they haven't been that efficient, it's been a different brand of basketball. So we'll see if they, you know, if they win the lottery or something and they get Scoot or Wemby, maybe it looks different. But for now, I think the Spurs have really transitioned to this motion offense that is really equal opportunity okay and they've been it's been equal opportunity for guys like malachi brandon sohan vassell Keldon johnson out of all those guys you know who, who's impressed you the most i think out of all those guys the person who's impressed me the most has been devin vassell i mm. was really excited for him to join the spurs a few years ago uh you know i do draft coverage every single year i, I scout players i write little scouting reports and stuff for our website I had him fourth on my big board that year. I thought he's a guy who could be a really dangerous defender and a guy who can maybe be, you know, your third best option on a, you know, competitive championship team who can occasionally get his, you know, own bucket out there. He can pull up from mid range, pull up from three, create for himself just a little bit. I didn't expect it to materialize this quickly, especially after mm -hmm. how he looked last season. Now the defense has fallen off a bit, but you can see every single game, you know, if it's the end of a shot clock and, and they just need someone to bail them out or it's the end of the game and they need a clutch shot or they're looking for somebody to, to get them on a run and they're going to spam that pick and roll with him and Pirtle. They've turned to him time and time and time again. And he's been relatively efficient, right? He's been top 10 in terms of volume shooters from mid range. He's been top 10 in terms of three point efficiency on a high volume three point shooters this season. So I've been really impressed with him there. You know, there's stuff he can work on and he doesn't put a lot of pressure on the rim, but if that's your second, third best player on a championship team, I think you're doing pretty well. So really impressed with Devin, especially given how he looked last season, where it just seemed like he might be a three and D guy like Mikel Bridges, which is no slight to him. That's an awesome player. But if you can get a guy who can create his own basket every once in a while, it's a big deal. So really impressed with Devin Vassell. He's been awesome. Awesome. That's great to hear. You know, that was like somebody that was on the Knicks uh, radar as well. Knicks obviously went with Obi Toppin that year. But where do you see Vassell for this team? Like, what do you think his role is moving forward? Do you see him as being the, the second option, third option, just a high level role player? What do you what do you make out of him? Yeah, I think he could probably be like a third best player on a championship team, like your third option on offense. I kind of liken him to a like a Chris Middleton that, you know, it's not a mm. one for one comparison. He's not a carbon copy, but certainly he, he can get to his spots in the mid range, right? He He's not super shifty. He doesn't create a lot of separation, but he's really long. He's really tall. He's got great elevation on his jumper, really high release point, really hard to guard that. I mean, even if you're in his face, he's going to get a shot off cleanly. And if he can give you, you know, those 20 points per game coming off screens, running a few pick and rolls, cutting to the basket, running in transition, you know, that, I think that's a really valuable player. So maybe that's not what Spurs fans want to hear. Maybe they think he's the next, you know, Tony or Timmy, but I don't see that. I don't think he's your cornerstone, but I think he can be one of your foundational pieces. Okay. And with these foundational, with him being a foundational piece, you got a youthful team. Uh, you, you talked about how the front office doesn't believe they're going to be competing for anything. This is more of like <laughs> development. Uh, so I guess, could we say, we can officially say this is there in the Wemby sweepstakes then, right? So we can officially say that. I hope so, but you know what? Last season, it looked like the Spurs were going to be in contention for a top five pick. They were 17 games below 500, and then you saw the Kings call it a day, the Lakers call it a day, the Blazers called it a day, and the Spurs said, 
you know, we're only like four games out of the plan. Let's really push this hard. We're not going to focus on development. We're going to play a lot of veterans. We're going to try to win. And what did they do? They they snuck into the plan. They lost <laughs> in the plan, <laughs> and they got the ninth overall pick, which Sohan's been awesome. But you know, every you know every day I would take a higher pick every single okay. day. You know, if you give me an option between a higher pick or the plan, higher pick. So we'll see what they do this season because it's a long season. We don't know which teams are going to call it a day and phone it in and give up. But I don't think the Spurs are going to be one of those. They're they're losing organically, but they're not necessarily losing intentionally, if that makes sense. So would you expect the Spurs to make a trade then to either offload players or do you think they would be a team that would try to acquire players around the edges to go back and compete for the play-in again? Yeah, I think they're probably going to be a seller, probably not seller? a buyer. I mean, we saw it last year. They they moved off of Derek White, um, you know, who was instrumental to their team over the last couple of seasons. They moved off of Thaddeus Young. They moved off of Drew Eubanks, who was, you know, somewhat useful player for them as a backup center. So I think they're probably going to be sellers. And if you look at who they're selling, it's probably going to be guys like Doug McDermott, Josh Richardson, Jakob Pertl. But Jakob Pertl has talked about how happy he is here. The Spurs don't mm. want to force anything. They want two first rounders. They're not going to budge off of that. So mm. we'll see if they get that. And if they don't, he's probably sticking around. But the other two, you know, what can you get for him? And who do you want to trade him to? And are they willing to make a deal with the Lakers? Because I think that's a team that would be very interested in those players. But as we've seen over the years, Pop has no interest and making their longtime rivals the Lakers better. <laughs> and like wh whether that's a good thing or bad thing for the organization, you know, he's stuck to his guns. He's just not interested in helping them out. So maybe he budges this year, but we'll see. I'm sure there'll be other teams that are interested in those guys because I think they're useful. I'm glad that you brought up Pop because he's been there for so long. You know, you had the Admiral <laughs> out there. You had uh, Tim Duncan, Ginobili, like I said. You seen the, we saw the DeMar DeRozan area that you talked about. Um, now you had DeJounte Murray, you had so many different players out there. You even had LA out there. There's, there's been so <laughs> many players that pops has got his, uh, had the privilege of coaching for so long. And, you know, now he's part of the coaching, uh, for team USA. We hear retirement. I I is he retiring? I is that the thing we'll start off there first? That's interesting because Mike Scotto asked him that before the game yesterday. And he pretty much was like, yeah, I'm not even thinking about retirement when wow. I, when I know I'll know, right? Like it's a feeling in my stomach when I know it, I'll know it. And when that happens, I'll let you know, like, I don't think he has any plans to retire. And I think a lot of people thought he was going to retire after LaMarcus was gone because that was the big promise to LaMarcus is that, you know, I'm not going to leave until you're done here. And he's been done here for like a year and a half. And this is the last <laughs> year of his contract. And Pop could walk after the season, but just with the way that he's talked about how much he loves coaching these young guys, that it's given him an opportunity he didn't really have with Duncan, right? You had like a MVP caliber player ready-made, came into the NBA, made you competitive from day one, right? You also had David Robinson, who was an MVP caliber guy. You had Manu and Tony, and you had Bruce Bowens and all these guys who were just ready to play. You didn't necessarily need to coach them. They were great leaders. And not that's not to say he wasn't coaching, but he wasn't getting the same chance to coach as you do with these young guys, right? Where you're bringing in Vassell's and Keldon Johnson's and DeJounte Murray's and Malachi Branham's and Jeremy Sohan's who they're good, but they need to be coached up. They're not foundational pieces from day one. And I think he's really, really enjoyed that. And I just don't see him giving that up anytime soon. Okay. That's awesome to hear. I mean, to, to see a coach that's now reinvigorated to be like, this is actually my opportunity to do this from, from scratch, which he, I guess, I don't know if he really wanted, but He's now been afforded that opportunity after winning so many times that you can you can give him that leeway because he's seen success with him. What do you what what do Spurs fans think about him overall, like as a head coach? Like, I know it's probably mostly like a high approval rating because of all the yeah. winning that he's done. <laughs> um, but like, let's get like the nitty gritty. Like, what what do fans have like gripes with? Like, I'm sure he does certain things that are like, come on, man, why are we still doing this? Why don't you adapt or change uh, from these ways? Yeah, I think most fans pretty much deify Popovich. They don't really have any problems with him. But I think over the last couple of years, I think it's just been the stubbornness not to commit to a direction. And, and we talked about it, and I won't go too deep into it because we could get lost in a rabbit hole. But you look two years ago, the Spurs only won four more games than the Toronto Raptors, and they were gunning for the plan. Well, the Toronto Raptors got to draft Scotty Barnes. I would have loved to have Scotty Barnes on the Spurs. Mm -hmm. Last year, we talked about how they gunned for the plan while their teams just gave up. Well, you know, they only won four more games than the Kings, and the Kings got, you know, Keegan Murray. They could have had Jaden Ivey. Love Jeremy Sohan. He's not those guys. So 
it feels like Spurs fans were very frustrated with one. He just is always intent upon we got to win no matter what. And even when this team isn't very good, we're going to try to win as many games as possible, which kind of gets you stuck in purgatory, right? I mean, the Spurs haven't competed for anything. They've not really been that bad. So they're not, you know, getting a foundational piece of franchise player. So fans have been frustrated with that. But I think more so than anything, it's watching guys like Lonnie Walker, you know, take a backseat developmentally to a guy like Marco Bellinelli. Or you see a player like, you know, a, a Blake Wesley who, you know, he played a few games here, but, you know, he's kind of stuck in the G League right now. And maybe he'll come up soon. You would hope so because you would hope they would prioritize development. But we've seen that over the last couple of years. And it's been different this season because there are so many young players and there are not a lot of guys who are standing in their way for minutes. But even, you know, Doug McDermott's playing a lot. Josh Richardson's playing a lot. And it took a lot to get Malachi Branham into the rotation, you know? So I think Spurs fans are a little frustrated by that, but I can understand you're not just wanting to throw guys into the fire. You want to set an example. You want to make them earn it. I understand it, but I do think Spurs fans, at least a small segment of them, are probably frustrated by that. And I can understand that to a degree. Interesting. Interesting. The stubbornness. I feel like we go, we get the same conversations over here for Tiz when it comes to like rotation and stuff like that. <laughs> I don't doubt Although, it. <laughs> but I, I see that for the Spurs, it's much different because you're looking for a direction, right? You talk about purgatory. We hear a lot about that on this show here where NBA purgatory, you know, you don't want to be like the Orlando Magic where you're just constantly in the playoffs. You're always competing, but you don't have a direction uh, to go up. You don't really have a direction when you're down to really go get some of those top players. We've had thorough conversations about that and we've you know we reviewed all other teams that could do that so it's interesting to hear that fans are looking for pop when they're so used to winning just to not win sometimes <laughs> and really go get that guy but you know what it's we, we we get to see this young team compete now against the Knicks team who who's surging so let's get into these matchups man because it's a rematch you guys got us the first time we came down <laughs> after uh a loss to the Dallas Mavericks where a lot of guys played an extensive amount of minutes um, and then go face against the San Antonio Spurs while they're in that Texas triangle tour and Spurs caught us. I wouldn't say sleeping, but just down after a frustrating loss, you play against just uh, the Mavericks who just have Luka Doncic. You lose within the last 33 seconds. I'm not even going to read the tweet that, <laughs> that was, that's been circling around. <laughs> uh nba twitter for being the first team to ever lose like that but it makes sense why player why players would be frustrated and they don't show up for the next game we also didn't have jalen brunson rj barrett now we got brunson back at least rj still questionable we'll see if he's back for tomorrow uh he has a lacerated finger from playing the mavericks but with brunson back i'm kind of confident for this team to to actually get some revenge. This is kind of a re revenge tour week, by the way. We just had the Suns who beat us earlier this season. Now we got the Spurs <laughs> and we have the Raptors to finish off the week uh, just for this nice little revenge tour. But the Spurs, man, are next on the list. And I'm look here are the matchups that I'm looking at. These are the these are the marquee matchups. I got well, let me ask you this. Is Devin Vassell back or is he still out? He's back. Um he he's pretty frequently listed as questionable because he's had a knee issue this year and you know, they haven't talked about how serious it is. Like, you know, will he need surgery or anything, but they've been managing his, his knee injury. So like when it flares up, he'll sit out two games instead of sitting out a month to get it a hundred percent. Cause they want him to play. Uh, so he could play he's listed as available, but anything could change between now and tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Cause I look at Devin Vassell as it, this will. Be... So if Devin Vassell is back, and he's your top guy. I'm looking at Quentin Grimes guarding him. And then it's, I got to put up uh, Sohan versus Julius Randle just because of the power forward matchup. And then Mitchell Robinson and Jakob Pertl as well. Those are my top three key matchups. Do you think that the Spurs would defend differently? Or what do you see as the other matchups that you're looking at that are important for this game? Yeah, I think, I, I don't know who would be guarding Keldon Johnson for the Knicks, but after that really long stretch where he was just really bad, you know, shot like 28% over 12 games. It was awful. He's really like kind of rediscovered himself, gotten back to the basics of what he does well. And I think over the last four or five games, he's averaging like 26 or 27 points per game on pretty solid efficiency. He's rediscovered his three point strokes. So I think that's going to be pretty important for the Knicks. I mean, if you want to stop the Spurs, I know Devin Vassell is the guy who's impressed me the most, but they still kind of operate as though, Keldon Johnson is the engine of this offense, their go-to guy. 
And so if you can't stop him, I think you're going to have a hard time stopping everybody else because once he starts getting downhill, you know, knocking down those catch and shoot threes, extra mm. eyes are on him and he can create for others. He's not a great creator, but once he's hot, it's a lot easier for everybody else to get going because the focus is taken off of them a little bit. So whoever's guarding Keldon Johnson, I think that's going to be a huge matchup for the Knicks. Okay. That could be Quentin Grimes too. He's our best. So Quentin Grimes is our best perimeter defender. You know, he's a two-way player, three and D guy as of right now. Can do a little playmaking on offense as well, especially when he drives and attacks the paint. He's usually looking for our centers down there just to get the easy dunks. But if if it's see, this is where this is where this is where it's gonna be an interesting matchup because I think height wise, Vassell is taller than than Keldon uh, than ta taller than Keldon Johnson, right? Um so let me make sure I'm I'm talking about that right. Yeah. Oh, actually, they're the same height. Look they're about six, the five. same height. Yeah. Six, yeah they're about the same height. Okay. So if that if if Keldon Johnson is your best score, then I'm seeing Grimes guarding him, and then quickly would probably guard Devin Vassell. There's no R.J. Barrett. That's how I look at it as. Um. But then my next matchup that you know for me is Sohan versus Julius Randall because Julius, even though Brunson is the head of the snake, the guy who operates uh, the entire offense. And really gets guys into position. Julius Randle's just been on a tear this season. He's playing back at his all-star level. And it's, you know, it's very, it's difficult to slow him down. I mean, you, you saw it earlier uh, in the first matchup, right? And Randle on the season right now is averaging 24 points, shooting 47% from the field. He's shooting 35% from three. You know, he's averaging about 10 rebounds right now. And he's getting you close to four assists. So he's just been a monster all overall. You know, he's recognizing the sec he's recognizing the double teams. How do you expect? Well, we already saw the Sohan matchup with Julius Randle. How do you expect? Because now you you've already seen how he plays. You know Brunson's coming back. How do you expect Pop to adjust to this to to stop Randall? Yeah, that's gonna be tough. I still expect Sohan to get that matchup. You know, I I don't think there's really anybody else who can assume that matchup on the Spurs. And it's funny because you look at the last couple of games, right? I mean, Luka Doncic had like 51 points against the Spurs and Sohan guarded him for a, lo a large part of the night. Uh, and I, I think the same thing with Julius Randle, where I think he went off for 42 against the Spurs, right? And you saw Sohan was on him for most of the night. I think Pop's just saying, hey, we're going to throw you into the fire. Whatever the, <laughs> the results are, we're going to live with that because this is valuable experience. You're going to be guarding, you know, they drafted him to guard multiple positions and this is a guy who's at his natural position, about the same size, about the same weight. I think it's going to be really tough for him, but I do think you look at the last game and, man, Randall has been so good. He's been on a tear, even with you know contested shots, even with physicality, hasn't bothered him. So I think Sohan's going to try to get under his skin, going to try to be physical with him. But honestly, when you have an all-star level player who's playing this well, sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes it just doesn't matter. So I don't think they're going to change a lot. But I do expect to see, you know, Sohan right back on him again. And it'll be valuable experience, even if he gives up another 40 spot to, to Randall. Okay. Yeah, that's that's how that's how I look at it as well, man. I think when you see guys who are just in their bag, it's very tough to stop them. So I guess the thing maybe Pop would do, and you let me know what you think about this, is then try to slow down Jalen Brunson. I didn't I don't consider like I think when you look at between Brunson and Trey Jones, it's Brunson's just the better player, but how do you look at trying to slow down Brunson? He just came back, put up 24 points yesterday. Didn't look like he missed a beat coming off a hip injury. He looks fine. What do you feel about that? Yeah, that's a tough matchup for Trey Jones. And it's been tough all year because he's the only point guard on this roster right now. Uh, you know, Blake Wesley is in the G League. He hasn't been brought up. So every time there's a small guard, it's, you know, Trey Jones gets that assignment all night long. And I think he's fairly good at the point of attack. He likes to, you know, get under guys because he is so small. He likes to apply a lot of physicality, a lot of pressure to the ball handlers. But I think just his lack of length, um, his size, he he's kind of an easy target. I mean, it's it's not for a lack of trying. He definitely puts the effort out there. But, you know, if, if Jalen Brunson is playing well and he's able to use screens and, you know, patiently kind of pick apart guys in the pick and roll and force switches, I don't think there's a lot that Trey Jones can do to slow him down. I think he can maybe annoy him, you know, try to deny him the ball when the ball isn't in his hands, but love Trey. I, I just, you know, he's a backup. He's a backup in the NBA who's being forced to start. So there's not a lot he can do, but it'll be interesting to see that regardless, you know, does Trey bother him any? I, I don't think so, but you know, it'll, it'll be worth keeping track of for sure. Do you, who's your best defender Vassell on the perimeter? 
Maybe. Uh, Vassell's been kind of off this season. He's taken such a huge load on, on the defensive end or on the offensive end this year. He's asked, been asked to do a lot more. Um, I think he's allowing his opponents to shoot about 54% from the field. So I think when he's really dialed in, he can be a really good defender. But, man, that's a tough question to answer. If you made me answer that question, who's the best perimeter defender on this roster? Probably Romeo Langford. Um, okay. And I know that's probably a random name, but Romeo Langford <laughs> to me is probably miles ahead of everybody else at this point. And his role is simplified, so it makes sense. I mean, that's kind of his job. Okay. I only look at it because through previous matches, we've seen like teams like what, yesterday against the Suns. We've seen Mikhail Bridges on Jalen Brunson trying to disrupt uh, Brunson from getting to his spots and really playmaking. So I was thinking that if Devin Vassell is that guy, maybe we see something like that. That's that, that was the only thought I had. I guess the last one I'll, I'll, we'll touch on is uh, Mitchell Robinson and Jakob Pertle because Mitch didn't didn't have it that time uh, against uh, Pertle. And Pertle's a good defender. I actually like Pertle as a player. What has Pertle's what is Pertle's impact for the team? Is he just a rim protector? What what, what, do you, what is he? Yeah, Pertle's kind of everything to this team. I know a lot of fans, like Spurs fans, have been kind of down on Pirtle the last couple of years. And I think, and this is like not supposed to be offensive to fans in any way, but I think most fans and rightfully so are casual fans, right? They're, they're just watching for entertainment value. They're looking at box scores. They're looking at the score at the end of the night. And if he's not, you know, playing a sexy brand of basketball where he's dunking or making phenomenal passes or, you know, blocking five shots a game, then they're like, well, what is he doing? Cause he's not, you know, he's not a lob target he's not a ball handler he's not a shooter he shoots poorly at the free throw line but he's everything for this team you know they they allow the most shots at the rim in the nba who's the guy who has to step up and guard those and make rotations from the weak side and cover for other people's faults it's purtle it's purtle every single time on the offensive end they use him as a hub kind of similar to not to the same degree but kind of like a demonis sabonis or nikola Jokic, where he's stationed at the elbows or the high post or the top of the key and he's making passes to cutters he's running dribble handoffs he's doing you know pick and rolls where he's screening and re-screening and he's a great short roll passer and he's got a really good floater i mean you look at the numbers he's like top mm. 10 in floaters this season mm. he was top 10 in floaters a season ago really efficient on that shot and he's also top 10 in terms of field goal percentage as a pick and roll role man. So he does a lot for this team, even though he's not a shooter, even though he's not, you know, a, a lob target, even though he may not block the most shots per game, but he does a lot for this team. And without him, they've been awful. They've been awful when he sits over the last couple of years. So for me, I know he's not the sexiest name and I know most teams probably or fans are, are you know, of other teams aren't looking at him when they look at games and going, that's the guy who's the key to everything. But to be honest with you, he's kind of the thing that on both ends of the court. You know, it's funny because I would think back to that Bleacher Report uh, was a game of, game of zones and how they just made <laughs> yeah. fun of him and the DeRo and DeRozan for Kawhi trade. That's, <laughs> that's I think that was everyone's first introduction to who Jakob Proto is like, who? But I actually think, <laughs> I think, it's, I think he's a good player. If you tune in on a nightly basis, you see how good he is. Um, all right. Well, let's 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 uh, change gears to where the uh, the interesting part of this matchup is the battle of the benches. And fun fact: the Spurs lead the NBA, as I know you're well aware, as uh, points per game. They're number one coming with points off the bench. As for the New York Knicks, where they used to be our strength, we are 25th on the season. So, and we, we kind of saw the glimpse of that too, right? In the first matchup, we just saw how the bench unit was able to seamlessly continue the scoring against the Knicks during the last matchup. Give us a little insight about this bench and because it's, well, who's this? Josh Richardson, Malachi Branham, uh, Doug McDermott, Keita Bates-Diop, or, or Stanley Johnson and Zach Collins. What, what's, what's, this, uh, what's this bench all about? I mean, I think you look at most Spurs teams and I think they pride themselves on their depth. There's only been one season in the last 22 seasons where their bench hasn't been top 10 in points per game in terms of bench units. So they're consistently really good off the bench. They like to rely on their bench. Um, you know, it was more effective when they were a really good team, right? Where their bench was putting teams away once they get that lead, right? Or they're maintaining the lead. Now you look at the Spurs and they're often, you know, trailing after the first or second quarter and their bench is just keeping them alive. So if you have a game where the Spurs starting unit starts off strong, their bench unit can put you away or they can, you know, at least at the very least maintain that lead for you. So if you're the Knicks and you have the Spurs down, you know, halfway through the first quarter and their second unit is coming in, 
that's not the time to take the foot off the off the gas. That's, that's the time to try to push their bench, try to keep your guys in maybe a few extra minutes, push the lead because you know, their starting unit isn't that good. But guys like Doug McDermott can knock down shots. Great three point shooter. Um, you know, Josh Richardson, he can initiate offense. He can also knock down the three ball. Romeo Langford is really great off ball. He's a great cutter. He's become better as a spot up shooter. He's a great defender. Kata Bates, Diop. I mean, a lot of these guys aren't sexy names. And I think I've said that, like, there's no sexy names, but they all do a really good job of just being serviceable. No one's a liability. Everyone is serviceable. So it'll be interesting to see who they go with because it has just been that, you know, carousel, so to speak. You know, some nights it's, you know, Zach Collins in, is, is in. Uh, other nights he's out. And then you've got Gorgie Jang, or maybe you even have, you know, Charles Bassey in, or you have Stanley Johnson in, or you have a guy like Keita Bates Diop in, or Romeo Langford. So you don't know who's going to be off the bench on any given night. Even Isaiah Roby got like 20 minutes last night against the Nets. So the one thing I can say is all those players are pretty much serviceable. There really aren't liabilities out there. I feel like that should be the slogan for the San Antonio Spurs. Not sexy because even when they had the big three, <laughs> it wasn't, no one was tuning in for the highlight reels. You know, everyone's going through YouTube, checking it. All right, who had the craziest dunk? Who had the craziest assist? You know, top 10 plays. Rarely would you ever see the Spurs in there, but it doesn't matter. It's, as you said, serviceable. Does it get the job done? That should just be the, <laughs> not sexy, gets the job done should be the, <laughs> the San Antonio Spurs lo- slogan. So let's let's tie let's put a bow on this uh this this show and let me get your take on what you think the final score would be would be. The last game was 122-115. Spurs taking the dub. What do you got for this one? I think depending on I, you said Jalen Brunson's in this game, right? That he is yes. playing. I think that's a huge difference. And even if RJ Barrett is questionable, if they make him available, you know, and I'm not saying it's guaranteed, but that's like pretty much like 42 to 43 points per game right there. The Spurs barely hung on. And I think that's like a trend, right? You see them, even when they build big leads, they barely hang on. They have like two games all year where they've won by double digits. Most of their games are decided when they win by like two possessions. So I think Jalen Brunson could easily be the difference between, okay, you're having to force feed it to Randall to try to win you win you the game. Or now you have multiple options and the Spurs just have nothing to slow you down. And when the game slows down, they're done. They just don't have a lot of self-creators. So I, I think that this next team is probably going to eke out a win this time. I don't think it's going to be a big win, but I do think it'll probably be, we'll throw out a score. Let's say 115 to 120 because the Spurs are giving up a ton of points per game this season. 115 to 120. Okay. 115. So then who, who's winning? You said the Knicks. I got the Knicks, Knicks in this one. Knicks, yeah, Knicks winning 120 to 115. Okay. I got the Knicks winning as well. You're the second guest I've had on that's given the Knicks a dub. Uh, the season. actually third <laughs> third guest third guest because we did one with our guy Corey <laughs> we didn't did one with uh Will Loof who covers the Raptors you're the third guest I, I like it I like when guests come on here <laughs> and show the Knicks some respect because you know what this franchise needs some respect for <laughs> for such a long time I'm gonna go in a different direction though I think this game the Knicks defense w- now that we have Brunson back we get to put McBride back in his natural slot we get to put quickly as the off-ball guy. He doesn't have to be the lead guard. And Grimes still does what Grimes does. I'm going to make this a low-scoring affair. I think there's going to be points, but I think it's going to be a low-scoring affair. I'm going to go with 108-96 Knicks um, just because the defense has just been on fire. We held the Suns to 83 points, even though they didn't have Devin Booker last night. I think the Knicks right now are getting back into the defensive ways. That's how I'm looking for the Knicks. Uh, And I think they do want that payback. So... That's why I got for this game. But Noah, thank you for coming on and, and giving us your knowledge. Please let our listeners know where they can find you. If you got any work that we should know and we'll be on the lookout for. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It was a blast. Um, if you want to follow me, you can find me on Twitter at N underscore Magaro, M-A-G-A-R-O. I also have a YouTube channel where I break down film about the Spurs. It's just my name, Noah Magaro George. we got the podcast we talked about earlier, Alamo City Limits. Um, and then finally, you can find my writing at Pounding the Rock. So check that stuff out. But again, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this. Love talking about Spurs basketball, love talking about basketball in general. So hopefully we can do this again sometime. Absolutely. No, thank you for coming on. It was a great pleasure again to, to meet you, talk about basketball, preview this matchup. And for Knicks Nation out there, make sure to support this channel. Like I said earlier, make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to give Noah a follow on Twitter for all of his insight. If you just love basketball, like all of us, right? Make sure to go check out his work and get some more insight on other teams around the league. 
Make sure to share these videos when you check them out. Make sure to leave a comment. Give us your thoughts about this game. Who do you think is going to win? What do you think about hearing about the Spurs side? You know, talk about purgatory. Do you agree with what they're... I know there's a lot of Knicks fans out there who are talking about purgatory. Ari, I know you're out there. I know you're out there, Ari. I know you're tuning in right now. Make sure to all leave a comment on what your thoughts are about this uh, the show. And last and certainly not least, please make sure to check out KnicksFanTV.com where you can catch all the recasts by our guy, Remy. And we also got other great articles over there too. Thank you, Knicks Nation, for tuning in. We out.